Hello friends, welcome to our channel Wisdom Alert. So in this video, we will give you a walkthrough, code walkthrough of uh, COVID detection model. How we will be building COVID detection model in this notebook. So uh, we are running this notebook on Google Colab so that we get the cheap feed, right? And I will share the whole code with you so that you can try this code in your uh, system or maybe in your Google Colab account. Okay, so first of all, we'll be um, um, importing some of the important libraries like uh, like you know that image data generator is used for uh, uh, data augmentation task. Uh, next, we are also using certain other libraries like model and sequential. So we all know that uh, there are two types of CNN models. One is sequential and one is model. So we'll be using model because mostly in uh, transfer learning approaches, we use model, not sequential ones. Apart from that, uh, we are also importing certain important uh, layers based uh, methods that is in input, dense, flatten, dropout, batch normalization, etc. So uh, after importing these all these uh, important libraries, we'll first mounting our uh, Google Drive because the data set is uh, present in our Google Drive with the name COVID underscore IEEE. So uh, when we mount our uh, data, which is uh, the message we found that uh, drive already mounted at this location. So after mounting the data, uh, what we have to do, we have to create three separate directories because we have three different folders uh, I al already uh, shown to you. Uh, there is COVID IEEE and we have three different folders, COVID, uh, having COVID images, uh, then we have normal images uh, with clear lungs as you can see and uh, viral pneumonia cases. Okay. So uh, this is the structure of our data set. Okay. Now let me open our app. So uh, after creating three different directories based on classes, we will be uh, writing one function so that we get the image specifications details. Okay. So uh, firstly, we are printing uh, all the details present in the data dot items, and what will be uh, present in the data dot items? Basically, what we are doing is uh, we are using blob library. To list all the files, whatever extension they have. Okay, uh, recursive is equal to two means it will uh, give all the files within the folder. Okay, and <coughs> next, uh, so first of all, we are uh, giving count of each of the files. So which whichever directory you pass in this folder, it will give the total uh, number of files present in the directory. What is the minimum width, maximum width, minimum height, and maximum height? Let me uh, zoom a bit, maybe then you can understand the code. Yeah, uh, so I hope the code is visible now. So you can see that. So what we are doing is basically first of all, we are giving image count. Second, we are giving minimum width. So minimum width, we are setting it as 10 into 100 because no image will be bigger than that. So we'll be taking the minimum of the actual min of that image and this. So this will be always higher. So that's why uh, we'll take the minimum one. Again, there's a maximum width. We are setting it zero. Uh, okay. So uh, no image will be uh, smaller than uh, mm. bigger than this one. Okay. Zero. Similarly, minimum height and max height. So now what we are doing is we are using image library to open the files. Okay. We are uh, giving uh, when we use. Uh, when we open any file to image, so we uh, we return two parameters that is width and height when we get im dot size. So we have to pass the image object and with that we have to pass dot size. We get two parameters as an output width and height. Okay. So as we get width and height, so what we are doing is we, we are calculating the minimum width by passing the width, which is the actual width, and the data min of width. Similarly, for max width, min height, and max height. And in the end, we are printing all the details. So, first of all, we have passed our normal directory. So, you can see we have 668 normal files. 
having 104 min width, 2628 max width, min height is 650, max height is 2628. So we can see that there is huge variations of in terms of sizes in the you know, norm, normal images. Second is the COVID direct. So in COVID directory, we have only 530, we have uh, around 536 images in which we have a huge variation in width. You can see there are some mobile type of images having 240 width, whereas we have 4K type of images having 4095 width. Similarly, uh, height is also similar. So now uh, what we are doing is we are basically creating the images, uh, list of images so that we can get the, all the list of image uh, file names uh, of all the directories. Okay, so for that we are creating three uh, uh, objects. Okay, C images, N images and V images and in that we are listing uh, directories in terms of OS.list directory. So here what we will get, we will get the path of all the images present in the uh, respective directories. Now let's see some of the sample images present in our data set. So first of all we have uh, uh, COVID infected images. So you can see this is this is somewhat uh, COVID infected images. So let me zoom out a bit. Yeah. So this is COVID infected images. You can see there is uh, ground glass opacity visible in each of the images. Okay. Next, uh, we have viral pneumonia cases. Okay. So you can see viral pneumonia is also, uh, it is visible. It is not clear. Haziness is observed in the left lung side. Okay. And then the lower lung also. So haziness is there and the, the and we can easily see that the lungs are not clear actually. Okay. Uh, and we can easily compare it with the normal images. You can see that uh, the, in, the lungs are properly clear. There is no haziness and there is no disturbance within the image of the lungs. Okay. So uh, this is the sample images and we get somewhat idea of how the COVID and viral and uh, normal images look like. Now we have to do some image pre-processing. So as I told you in my first video that we will be using white balance technique. What it does is basically it is stretched the, all the three channels, uh, RGB, which is RGB, the, in case of color images. And uh, what it does, wherever we have a dark ray, it increase the, it increase the uh, uh, basically white uh, component of it during the stretching okay so so that uh, this negative uh, or you can say the dark part will not negatively affect the image and it will give the overall brightness to the image so there will be no darker part uh, only there will be a brighter side of it or you can say the enhanced image you will see after applying the white balance so how we are applying white balance you can see we, we are passing in terms of, uh, we are getting two variables, mi and mn, and that is through np dot percentile, in which we are passing the channel and percent. So what we are doing is, we are only using 0.05% of the darker uh, part of the image. Okay, and rest, everything, the rest, all the colors present in the middle part will be stretched or spread throughout the image. So this is the uh, formula actually, which we have implemented here. So it will, uh, when you pass the channels and percent in it, it will return a channel that is wide valence. So what we are doing is basically we are uh, doing uh, np.d stack. So what it does, uh, first we have to split the images into three channels and in each of the channel, we have to apply this wide valence. Okay, and then we have to convert this uh, uh, object into uh, <clears throat> RGB to uh, gray, okay. And after that, uh, so it it will convert into gray image. So uh, after that, what we'll be doing, we'll be converting the color BGR into gray image. So it it will be a uh, gray image after applying uh, white balance. So you can see there is the enhancement of the image in comparison to this original image.
So like that, we will get the enhanced image so that we can see the patterns easily within this image. Now the next part is data loading. So what we are doing here, right? So let me again zoom a bit. So what we are doing here, basically we are iterating over the directories, over the, all the three directories. And uh, after iterating uh, each of the directory, uh, we are passing one variable. That is just, you can say, uh, one image in the directory. Okay. And <laughs> we are passing the whole path. Uh, within the directory, so it is the normal one, and we are passing the one sample image. So sequentially, it will iterate for each of the image. So it will give the whole path to uh, OpenCV to read the image, and then we'll apply this uh, white balance, okay, and convert it into uh, color to uh, color gray to RGB. So here, what we have done is basically we have converted the white balance image into from color to uh, gray. Now what we are doing is because we, we have to use all the three channels. So what we are doing is we are converting the gray image uh, <coughs> to RGB. Okay, color gray to RGB using CVT color. And now we have to resize it into 224 cross 224. So the reason for resizing it into 224, 224 because it's a standard size of uh, mostly uh, all of our transfer learning models. So in mobile net also, we have a standard size, standard size of the input image that it's 224 cross 220. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and uh, for each of the class, we are appending in the data list and labels list. So data and label basically two lists we have taken and we, uh, we are keep on iterating over each directory, appending the images with labels. So for normal, we are assigning it as zero label. For COVID, we are assigning it as one. And for viral infections, we are assigning it as two. So we have three labels, zero, one, two. Now the important part, so uh, uh, that we have done even in skin cancer. So we have to save these images uh, in this structured format. And uh, we'll be saving it into the form of NumPy arrays so that we can later in for future reuse, we can load it pretty easily in less amount of time. So what we are doing is basically we are converting these features and labels in the form of array using np.array. So now the images are converted into array format. And now we are saving it in the form of NumPy arrays in our Google Drive. Next comes, uh, so we have saved our images in uh, Google Drive uh, in, the, in the directory. Now we'll be loading the images. So uh, this will take very, very few time, uh, minimum amount of time to load it uh, or in comparison to loading uh, physical images. So this, this part, actually when you execute this part, it will take a good amount of time, maybe uh, around five to six minutes. While this one will hardly take one minute to load, right? Maybe in terms of only 30 to 40 seconds it will take. So, uh, sorry, uh, this this part, loading the images. So, uh, now we have uh, loaded the images in the form of feeds. Feeds, nothing is the features and labels are the labels. So now the next part is we are actually randomizing the order of the image so that it will not take any sequential order during the model training part, or it will not break. It will not uh, uh, learn any specific order of the images. So that's why we are randomly shuffling all the images, and uh, then we are creating two variables that is number of classes, unique labels, and the length of the data that is 1823 because it will be used later where where when we use uh, when we do train test split so now we have uh, to uh, divide our data set into training and test set and in this we'll be using 80% data for training and 20% for testing so here we have to use our length data so what we are doing is basically we are uh, mm -hmm. taking all the data before 20% uh, that is 
eighty percent of the data will be using for training and uh, for testing. We are using only twenty percent. Similarly, for Y train and Y test uh, in the form of labels, we are doing this. Now comes another very important part that is uh, image normalization. Okay, so let me uh, write it as uh, image normalization. So what it uh, so how we are normalizing the image? We know that we have a color image, right? And we have a uh, uh, image in the scale of zero to two two fifty twenty to two fifty five. And we have total 256 colors present within the image. 256 numbers present in the color images. So what we are doing is, uh, when we have a huge number of uh, huge numbers in the form of 0 to 256, and when we directly pass this image into our CNN model, so during convolution operation, it will be pretty complex and will take huge amount of time for the model to converge to a local optimum, okay, or local minima. In the form of loss matrix. So uh, to reduce this time, model training time, and to reduce the complexity and bring more sim simplicity within our model. So uh, in that way, we have to uh, normalize our image. So when we divide our images by 255, it will scale the images in the form of 0 to 1, where 1 denotes uh, darker side that is black color or more grayish color. And zero denotes whiter one. Okay, so in that way, uh, when we use, uh, when we divide it, uh, when we divide by two fifty five, and the whole images will be in zero and one, and it will take very uh, lesser amount of time for model to converge and to remodel training to, in comparison to color images with two fifty five parameters. Now comes. The two categorical parts. So we have to basically categorize, convert our target variables in using two categorical in the form of you can say dummy in the two. We have to. So next comes our image augmentation. So image augmentation, we all know that image augmentation. Why we do? So when we have unbalanced images in different classes. We generally used to augment images of certain classes so that uh, the model will become more robust, and it will not be biased toward one class. So in this case, we will be applying image augmentation on all of the three classes uh, universally, and for that we will be using uh, three parameters. One is rotation range, so it will rotate the image at the angle of 15 degree, not much. Horizontal flip, so the images will be flipped horizontally, and fill mode will be used in nearest. Uh, the reason for using only three parameters is that when we actually experiment with more parameters like zoom range, shear range, brightness level, so it actually reduces the performance of our uh, deep learning model. So that's why when we used only these three parameters in image augmentation. We certainly got very good accuracy, so that's why that's the reason we have used these three parameters. So let me demo you what whatever the parameters we have used after applying these parameters or this augmentation, how the image each of the image changes. So in that, what we are using, we are creating one uh, directory preview one, and we'll taking only one image out of it to actually perform all the transformations. Okay, so we have taken this image, reshaped it, and now we are uh, applying augmentation at a batch size of one because we have only one image here, and all the uh, transformations will be saved in this directory. Preview underscore one with the prefix org underscore image, and the format will be changed. So now uh, we iterate over it, and uh, once we get 50 images, okay. It will break. So this this uh, whole augmentation will break after 30 transfers. After 30 images, okay, after it generates 30 images. So next we will be plotting all the images which are present in the preview one uh, folder. So this is our original image, and these are the transformation. You can see we are getting some uh, <coughs> uh, rotations, and then we have a horizontal flip, right? 
So originally it was like this, then we have some rotation, then we have horizontal flips and rotations. So like that the images are generated. Now we will build, uh, build our model that is the most interesting part. And here we have to first download our mo mo mobile net V2 model. We will be passing weights that is ImageNet. We all know that uh, ImageNet is a very important data set. And uh, this is basically a valuation data set for all the transfer learning models. So all our transfer learning models like VGG16, uh, ResNet, uh, and ExceptionNet, ImpeptionNet, uh, MobileNet, all are tested on this ImageNet uh, data set because it is a data set for classification of different objects uh, of around 100 classes. And uh, mobile net performs well in terms of accuracy, training time, and uh, precision and record. So uh, here we are basically passing it as a base uh, layer. And in this, we are uh, basically uh, telling it that we have to make these layers as trainable. OK. And next, what will uh, we, we have also passed one parameter that is include top is equal to false. Because uh, we, we don't want to train uh, whatever the top layers present. And we want to capitalize the uh, capability of our mobile net model. So whatever the learning it has, we'll, we'll actually use the capability of this mobile net model. And on top of that, we will be actually customizing it. OK. So and uh, as I told you, we are using model here, not sequential. So on top of that, uh, on top of our base model, we are passing basically, we are doing average pooling. Then we are uh, adding some uh, layers in terms of tens units, OK? The neurons, 5, 12. Then we are passing some dropouts. So dropout, as I told you, it breaks symmetry. And it also bring down the uh, overfitting problem of uh, deep learning models. So here in the last layer, we are passing three uh, as a parameter because we have three classes. Activation, we are passing softmax because we have more than two classes. Okay. So and then we are printing the model summary. So as you can see, we have around a uh, very big summary actually. So we have around. Uh, uh, 29 lakh 55,843 parameters that is trainable parameters. Okay, so this is somewhat the architecture of our uh, model. Now we are also passing some callbacks. So callbacks are generally uh, those things which we generally use during the uh, model training stage. Okay, so what it does is basically if you want to save the model at certain point of time during the uh, training stage, we can uh, save it at a particular, uh, let's say if we get the minimum validation loss, so it will only save the model which have over all the epochs, uh, which has the very low or minimum validation loss. So that will be our best model. So uh, that's why we'll be saving the weights of only those uh, those model which have certainly very minimum validation so we'll be monitoring validation loss here. now uh, the second is reduce lr and plateau this is the uh, learning learning rate annealing technique in which we actually uh, closely adjust the uh, learning rate based on the performance of the model so what it does is basically it monitors the validation loss and if we have a if we have no improvement for uh, two consecutive epochs so this patience is two means two consecutive epochs if we have no improvement then it will reduce the learning rate of the model by a factor of 0 0.3 and we have de uh, defined that minimum learning rate should be this much. It should not be lesser than this. So it, it will keep on reducing the learning rate until we reach at this point. Okay. 
so now next we have to compile our model by uh, declaring some of the things like uh, loss categorical cross entropy because we have a multi class classification problem okay if we have a binary problem then we can pa pass as binary cross entropy okay next uh, optimizer we are using adam we know that optimizer adds non linearity to the model okay because it's generally image based problems are complex problems huge number of features and it it will never be a linear problem so to bring non linearity we use optimizers and adam is the best uh, optimizer to generally use in uh, image related image related classification problems metrics we are using accuracy so now uh, during the fitting so this this is our batch size we are setting our batch size in 60 so now we are fitting our model in which what we are doing in terms of training set we are passing from the augmentation flow now we in this case we have to pass also steps per epoch which is nothing but the training length divided by uh, batch size and uh, this uh, division should not be in terms of uh, uh, it should it should be whole figure right it should not be in points uh, two decimal place or three decimal place it should be whole figure uh validation data we are passing x test and y test and validation test steps are something test length divided by the batch size epochs we are used actually 50 and also passing all the call wax which we are using so here we can also use uh, the stopping criteria which which is nothing but when the when you when we when we pass certain criteria and early stopping uh, call back feature in which it uh, monitors somewhat the performance of the model if the, if it doesn't improve after let's say 5 epochs or 10 epochs it will automatically stop the model learning and uh, it will make the model available after certain uh, condition of early stop so that will help in unnecessarily uh, stop the unnecessary training of epochs so now actually we want to know how it will behave in 50 box so we have not used any stopping here so it actually ran for around 50 box and you can see that after 50 box we get the accuracy of uh, validation accuracy of 95.88% which is not bad it is a very good accuracy in such a complex problem so now let we let uh, so so in this part basically we are plotting model performance so uh, the model performance actually help us in understanding how the model our model behave during the entire training process so we can see that after uh, let's say uh, 12 or 13 epochs model stabilizes and its its accuracy reached over 90% and it stays above 90 after 13 14 epochs similarly the same pattern observed in the validation loss after 13 to 14 epochs the validation loss loss reduces and it uh, it close it closes with the uh, training validation loss training loss basically and uh, it is stabilizes now uh, we have to load our best model so we are actually we have to load the model using load model functionality load model method and in that we have to pass our actual weights which we have saved now uh, because we can use our model later uh, future if you want to monitor or evaluate our model so that's why we are saving the model in our drive only and then again we are loading it from our drive so after that when we evaluate it we found that our accuracy is on test accuracy is 95.6% which is almost a now the question comes that um, uh, there are some other evaluation uh, methods also that is confusion matrix classification report which will give the class wise performance of the model so in this case we are plotting our confusion matrix and uh, we found that in while well, plotting confusion matrix our model is performed pretty well in identifying covid 19 cases you can see only two wrong 
and that two are uh, one it predicted incorrectly as normal and one it predicted incorrectly as viral. Uh, similarly, uh, we can see that uh, normal cases are also very good detection rate for normal. Only six uh, mistakes it done, and uh, and in viral cases it it is relatively lower in terms of performance. As you can see, eight mistakes it has done, and that too it uh, confuses with the normal images. So seven images it predicted as normal, but but it was actually viral. Mm -hmm. So uh, let let us let's see the classification report. So we can see that in classification report we have uh, a recall of 96 percent in normal case, 98 percent in COVID-19, and in viral we have relatively lower detection rate. That is 93 percent. So that is the overall performance of the model in terms of. Uh, Confusion matrix and classification report. Now there is another metric that is ROC value, ROC curve basically. Uh, and in this, we will see that what is the detection rate in terms of uh, each of the classes. Okay. So uh, we have actually plotted in the way that we have first we have plotted uh, ROC curve for individual classes and then we have combined the uh, ROC curve for all of the classes and that too in a zoom. So you can see that this is the ROC curve for class 0 that is uh, normal class and we have area of 1. Next we have a uh, for class 1 that is uh, COVID that is also area 1 AOC area. And now we have a uh, uh, ROC curve for normal uh, for uh, viral cases, and it has area of 0 0.99. And it is the combined image. Okay, let me uh, zoom out uh, a bit. So now you can see the whole image. So it is combined image, and which we can see the performance of all the three classes in terms of ROC. So now comes a very important uh, section that is sample prediction. So we have built our model, evaluated our model on three parameters. Okay, and now we have to actually see how the model performs if we supply some random images. So what we have done, we have randomly supplying images from test set, and uh, we are seeing that how the model performs, how many uh, mistakes it has done. So luckily in this uh, randomized uh, iteration or batch, we don't have any uh, mistakes. All the uh, images are correctly classified. You can see the normal, viral, COVID-19. So all three classes are correctly classified in this batch. So now comes the very, very important part that is model interpretation, that is grad camp. So as I told you in the last uh, skin cancer video, in which I have given the same method for visualizing the gradients of our model. Uh, so this is the same method, make grad cam heat map, get image array. And uh, then we are actually preparing uh, our image for uh, prediction, basically. So uh, reading the images, wide balancing, resizing, converting into array divided by 2 to 5. And then we are <laughs> removing the last layer, the softmax layer, and then the prediction. So if we visualize it, the prediction will look like something like this. The image is not visible, but the area is visible where the actual uh, focus of the model is. So, uh, so the one important part which we have to supply that is last convolution layer name and for mobile net we have block 16 depth wise which we can easily sleep during model dot layers so we have to write one uh, uh, in, uh, list comprehension for layers and layers something like that so that we can get all the layers printed and we can easily see that which is our last layer so we have to supply three parameters in make grad cam heat map the image the pre-processed image the model and the last convolution layer name 
So now we have given the image path. So this is our original image. Okay. When we pass it from uh, when we have to build a grad camp heat map. So for that we have to create one another uh, function that is save and display grad camp. So when we pass it, uh, okay. So let's say we have this image, okay. And this is our uh, COVID image. Uh, and total COVID-19 means uh, uh, this person died actually due to COVID. So this is our original image. When we pass it from our uh, grad camp heat map. So it has highlighted the actual region which are responsible for uh, COVID-19 gestures. Similarly, we have the second image. Uh, it is basically also COVID image. Okay. And we can easily see the haziness and the ground glass opacity here, uh, which is correctly highlighted. Okay. You can see that. Uh, so our model is actually looking in the right direction. Okay, uh, while predicting uh, any COVID normal and uh, viral pneumonia cases. So this is it. This is our whole uh, modeling process. So in this video, we have given you the code walkthrough of whole, whole of the uh, model building process. I hope you understand it. And this code is also available uh, in our Git, right? So you can easily access it. You can easily run it on Google Code app. It will not take much resources and uh, you can easily run, or run it on a free GPU on your Google Code app. Okay. Apart from that, we have also written, uh, uh, we have also written uh, <coughs> complete write-up in the form of blog. So you have to visit the wisdom ML and here you can see that we have a full technical write-up of, uh, with code base. So if you want to understand each and every point, so we have given the explanation for each of the techniques we have used and uh, with complete code. So I hope guys you like our videos and we'll meet in the next video in which we'll be building the class application for uh, loading chest x-ray images and predicting it uh, based on our model. Thanks.